The prologue in Game of Thrones, the first book in the A Song of Ice and Fire series, is perhaps the most important in setting up the rest of the series. So the prologue of Game of Thrones is about 11-ish pages. It depends on which book and version you have. Maybe you have a Kindle, a PDF. I have this version as of right now. It is definitely not the first because I destroy books that I read and reread and over and over. That's why I have those leather bound A Song of Ice and Fire books behind me that I don't ever fucking touch besides to dust and move around. I'm not reading those. I'm not ruining them. You're an animal if you don't have a book of your favorite series and it just sits on your shelf to look at and be pretty. Animal. So let's do a synopsis of the chapter before getting into the nitty gritty details. Three men of the Night's Watch are tracking wildling raiders beyond the wall. During their search, they encounter the others, or White Walkers, who kill one of them and leads to the other dying. And the last one flees in terror before he's executed in a later chapter. Best line of this chapter is definitely, dance with me then. This prologue gives us a clear enemy the others. But you will see as the book goes on and all the other books, you become distracted by the Game of Thrones. All these intriguing characters and houses fighting and squabbling. And interestingly, George even said that the others were a stand-in for climate change in our own world. So while we're all bickering and fighting for power and politics and being distracted, global warming or climate change is happening, killing our planet, and we're not noticing this big enemy that we should all be focused on. And in the books, the others are raining down death. They're coming to destroy the realms of men, but they're so busy squabbling over the throne and their own interests that they, they don't notice. So I think it's interesting that he was talking about climate change back when no one really was. People still were, but not as crazy intense as they are now. So, George, always before your time. Of course, we know on the show the threat of the others perhaps wasn't the biggest threat, like George is making it sound like it is in the book series, so let's go into the, the deeper details of the prologue. The prologue begins just before night and beyond the wall with a ranging party of men from the Night's Watch that were sent by Lord Commander Jor Mormont to track some wildling raiders. Three members are in this party. Garrod, Sir Waymore Royce, and Will, and they're about an eight or nine day ride out from the wall. Their dynamic is not the best. Garrod is an experienced member of the Night's Watch, in fact being there over 40 years, and he expects a certain level of respect. Royce has been at the wall for less than half a year, and this is his first ranging. In fact, he is the least experienced man in that ranging party, yet he's in command of it because Lord Commander Gior Mormont gave it to him because he's a knight and he didn't want to dishonor his father, Lord Royce. So, not good. 18, handsome and graceful, Waymar is the youngest son of the ancient house Royce that had too many heirs. He also brought a super expensive all-black wardrobe to the Night's Watch and a sick-looking sword that gets him mocked behind his back. Garrett spends a lot of time being angry with him and fighting with the younger man. The last member of the party, Will, had been a poacher that was caught by Malister Freeriders in Malister Woods, skinning one of their bucks. He was offered the wall or to lose a hand, so now he had been at the wall and part of the Night's Watch for four years. Because he is incredibly silent when moving through the woods, he had gone on a hundred rangings by the time of this chapter. He also really doesn't want to be brought into the tension between Garrod and Royce. Interestingly, we learn on the nine day ride out from the wall when they were traveling north and northwest to find the wildling raiders, the weather keeps getting worse and worse. At this point when we're reading the prologue, if you've never read the books before, you're thinking, oh, okay, the weather's just getting worse. It's later that you discover, oh, the cold coming and the weather getting worse is a sign of the others. Royce wants to continue on ranging, but Garrod wants to turn back towards the wall because Will scouted ahead and found the wildling raiders dead in their camp. Royce, who kind of has a chip on his shoulder because he's the youngest, most inexperienced, this is his first command, he doesn't want to go back a failure, asks Garrod if the, the dead on man him so, which 
You know, at the time, we're thinking, yeah, yeah, the, the dead aren't that frightening. George lets us know right away. Yeah, the dead are frightening. Be very afraid. Will adds in that his mother told him that dead men sing no songs, which I guess is true, depending on what you consider a song. Beautiful. Roy says that his wet nurse told him the same thing, and he gives Will some advice. Never believe anything you hear at a woman's tit. Thanks, Royce. Way to ruin it for us. Dick. Garrett, in his many years of experience, can tell something's not right. Will, even though he hasn't been there nearly as long as the other man, also can feel the general unease. Royce is fucking oblivious. Maybe he could just be putting on a show. Again, a young guy being put in charge of his first ranging. He has a little bit of an ego, so even if he did have a feeling of unease or something wasn't right, he's probably not going to say anything. Also, he just doesn't have the experience maybe to know what feels right and what doesn't. The two more experienced men being nervous is very important because we learned that Will, when he went on his first rangings, had diarrhea because he remembered all the stories beyond the wall. But at this point in his Night's Watch career and ranging career, those things, those stories no longer frighten him. The fact that he's now frightened is a huge, huge deal and a huge warning to us readers. But Royce wants to continue on and wants Will to actually show him the dead bodies because in Royce's defense, Will reports, yeah, they just were kind of slumped in their camp. There was no blood. It just looks like they died or froze to death. And Royce rightly says, the wall is weeping. They didn't freeze to death. It's not cold enough yet. So he wants to see the bodies himself to make sure they weren't sleeping or it wasn't a ruse. Unfortunately, him not wanting to go back a failure is what gets him in the end. Royce, you little sweetheart, you. I'm sorry. Eventually, they get close to the camp. Will takes Royce while Garrett stays behind. When Will and Royce get to the spot, the bodies are gone. Will is told by Royce to get up a tree and try to spot them. And this is when things go bad quickly. Royce calls out, who goes there? And Will stops climbing to listen. There's a rustle of leaves, the icy rush of a stream, a distant hoot of a snow owl, and the others make no sound as they come forward. Will sees movement in the corner of his eye, pale shapes gliding through the wood, a white shadow in the darkness. Both men feel them, and Royce asks, why did it get so cold all of a sudden? And that's when they emerge from the woods. And I want to read a description of the others in the prologue because I think it's just fucking epic. Tall, gaunt, and hard as old bones, with flesh pale as milk. Its armor seemed to change color as it moved. Here it was white as new-fallen snow. There, black as shadow, everywhere dappled with the deep gray-green of the trees. The patterns ran like moonlight on water with every step it took. Now the weapons description of the other is even better. In its hand was a long sword like none that Will had ever seen. No human metal had gone into forging that blade. It was alive with moonlight, translucent, a shard of crystal so thin that it seemed to vanish when seen edge on. There was a faint blue shimmer to the thing a ghost light that played around its edge. And somehow Will knew it was sharper than any razor. This is when Royce takes his sword with both hands and says, dance with me then. Yeah, the most badass line in the prologue. Yeah, he's a spoiled prick, but dance with me then in the face of an unknown threat that looks pretty freaky. Royce, you're an absolute bamf. Unfortunately for him, five more others come out of the woods to watch him with their deep, deep blue eyes that no human can have. The first other and Royce fight, and every time their two weapons meet, it makes a high, thin sound at the edge of hearing like an animal screaming in pain. The anguished sounds of their swords hitting makes Will want to cover his ears. Eventually, the other hits beneath an arm of Royce, cutting him, and says something in a language they can't understand. We're told the other's voice is like the cracking of ice on a winter lake, 
and Will could tell the words were mocking. I love this because it shows us right away the others have an ego. They have pride. They are mocking a man that is fighting to survive. We know the Night King in the show, which I think eventually we will get a Night King in the books or a a general ringleader and that's the nickname they give them, but don't say that because people freak out on you. But we also saw the Night King had an ego in the show. I also like that right away George shows us that they are complex, intelligent creatures and that they have their own language. And fun fact, we almost got a White Walker language in the show. It was created, but then D&D decided, eh, we're not, we're not gonna use it. Finally, Royce charges while shouting for Robert and the other almost lazily parries. And when their swords meet again, Royce's shatters into a hundred pieces and Royce shrieks, covering his eyes and going to his knees, blood pouring out between his fingers. This is when the others come forward and their swords rise and fall as they run Royce through over and over, just butchering him, their voices and laughter as sharp as they do so. Much time passes before Will decides to climb down from the tree because he sees the others are gone, and he goes to pick up Royce's twisted sword, believing he can bring it back to the Lord Commander, to the wall, and they'll know what to make of it and what to do. Unfortunately, when he stands up, Royce is standing over him. His clothes are tattered, his face ruined, and a shard of his sword in a blind white pupil of his left eye. The right eye, however, was open and it was blue. The last thing we read is Will dropping the sword, closing his eyes to pray, and Royce's icy cold hands, gloved in the finest moleskin, brushing his cheek and tightening around Will's throat. Later we learn that Garrett became spooked and fled and he gets executed in another chapter, but that's a, another chapter. So like I said in the beginning, this prologue is huge in setting up the main threat of the series. But as I continue on with these chapters, you'll see how easy it is to get swept up in all the other things and not the looming death threat from the North because all these characters are so much fucking fun. 